Welcome to our video, Caring for God's People. Thank you for being a part of this project, Caring for the People of God and the ministries that you're carrying on. I welcome you as a part of either a group or as an individual watching this and would love to be there with you. But I know that those who are leading you or you by yourself will have great insights on the topics that we're bringing up. I should first introduce myself and give a little background. I'm Dan Pavola. I'm a theology professor at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Before coming to Concordia 16 years ago, I was for 12 years a parish pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Butternut, Wisconsin. You won't know where Butternut is. It's a small 400-person town in the far, far north woods of Wisconsin by Lake Superior. But it's a wonderful place to do ministry. 650 members in a church in a 400-person town. Go figure. But it's talking about Butternut and some experiences also at caring for, with folks at Concordia that I hope to be able to share some things that will intersect well with your ministry and blessings on that ministry that you're doing. We have five things that we want to accomplish in this video today. Four of them are biblical principles that we can see clearly repeated time and again as God cares for and directs people. And I think those biblical principles work really well in your care for people, again, in your congregation or ministry. And then after those four biblical principles that we discuss, we'll discuss on how to make visits for people, whether they're in their homes, hospitals, or wherever you find them, again, in your ministry. But going back to those four biblical principles, here they are. The first one is, well, about the first. It's not the first, but the second that counts. The second is, God cures with the illness itself. The third is a quote from Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the last one is, grace will turn your life upside down. Again, we'll take each one of those on individually and find a link between what God has done with his people and what he's doing still with your ministry. So let's begin with the first one. It's not the first, it's the second that counts. I bet you've had a lot of experiences with that. When has it been that the first really wasn't much, but the second, oh, so much better? It wasn't that first place you lived. Remember that first apartment that you had, that first place that you moved into? Ooh, wasn't very good, was it? No. But the second, much, much better. It wasn't the first car that you bought. Remember that piece of junk that just really was, ah, it was almost dead the day you bought it? That wasn't much. But the second, not bad. In fact, you maybe are still driving that second car much, much better. How about jobs? Remember the first job you ever had? Barely, and you'd kind of like to forget some parts of it because it wasn't much. But the second, so much better. All right. It's easy enough to say that we see this at work in our own lives. The first is not the one that matters. It's the second that counts. But how about God? Well, God does it. Time and time again, biblically, we see how God works out the same principle in a number of different ways. On the slide that you're seeing, you'll see at least four of the topics that come to mind. I know you're racing ahead and putting specifics in each one of those as we speak about them, and we'll do some of that with you. It might be, first of all, people. God shows a preference for not the first, but the second. Now, it could be the firstborn. Doesn't Esau and Jacob come to mind? It's not firstborn Esau that matters, but secondborn Jacob. Or it could be people spread out over a greater distance. It's not the first, that is Saul, first king of Israel, but the second, David, who really matters. That's just one example. Think people. Next, think about places. One place superseded by the other. Oh, best example that comes to my mind would be it's not the garden, Eden, that really matters. It's the second garden. Remember how the Bible ends in Revelation as heaven, depicted as, well, essentially Eden come back to us. Eden perfected and preserved. It's not the first. It's the second that's really going to matter. It might be an object. It could be large, could be small. But that object, it's not the first, but the second. Think the tabernacle 
that the people of Israel had, but the tabernacle, that first place of worship and meeting, that's not the one that mattered. It's the temple. And even within the temple, it's not the first temple, but there was the second. And we could keep on going with that a series of temple leading to greater temple. We all know where it's going to end. And finally, maybe it's an action. It's that action of one that is superseded by another. Simple example, I bet you're thinking of this one already. John the Baptist says, I'm as though nothing. I baptize you with water, but there's a greater one who's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The act of baptism, the first with water, superseded by the action of baptizing done by Jesus. Well, those are at least four ways in which God does this principle again and again as we watch it in scriptures. Before we go on to more specific examples and how you'll apply this in your own ministry, why would God do that? Why would he show a preference for the second over the first? I think, first of all, it shows his power over his world, his, his creativity. He still has his hands on his creation. You know, creation is not just good on those first days of creation, but he still finds an ability to, out of what has been fallen, to bring out his will and do his work. It's not that perfect creation that was only in Eden. It's the second, this fallen world, that really counts. The first is an expression of perfection, but the second is even better because it's an expression of his creativity, his power, and his forgiveness. The second is better than the first. Also, I, I think that God shows a great patience with people and he shows that patience as something for us to follow. If we adapt this into our thinking, it's not the first, it's the second that counts. Doesn't that beget patience? I can just hear God saying to us again and again, now just be patient. This might just be the first. We don't always see that we're in the middle of the beginning. We always are imagining this is the end and it's never going to change. But God, by this principle, would suggest to people it's only the beginning. This is just the first. Something much better is coming. So let's take those ideas and see how they work out in the actual lives of individuals and God's action and people. And as we're doing that, begin to think of how you're going to take that into the ministry that you're performing and carrying out with people that you know. You're going to know some of these characters that we're going to speak about. You're going to recognize the situations and actions biblically because they're also ones that are in your ministry. Some of the examples, uh, Abraham and Sarah, aren't they the first, that is a childless couple, who are given this unbelievable gift of a child when there is no possibility. But they're only the first, and then a second comes. And that is, of course, Elizabeth and Zechariah in the New Testament. When Luke begins to tell us in Luke chapter 1 that Zechariah is given this great news that though he is much too old, he's going to have a son, finally, it's got to take us immediately back to the same news given to Abraham and Sarah. And while it's wonderful that Isaac is born to Abraham and Sarah, isn't it even better that we are now fast-forwarded to John the Baptist? because he's the one who's going to open the way for the Savior himself. And so great news in a similar manner, first to the one, but even better to the second couple. Maybe it's two pairs as examples of the first and second. Moses leads to Joshua. I love that pairing. Moses certainly is important. Oh my goodness. The Exodus, Passover, Ten Commandments, all those things done through Moses. And yet, there's yet a second who's better, more important. In Joshua, we finally have someone who takes the people out of Sinai, out of the desert, over and through the Jordan into the promised land. Moses is wonderful, but the journey only begins with Moses. It's fulfilled in Joshua. And isn't that pairing repeated then with John the Baptist and Jesus? As Moses is to Joshua. John is to Jesus. Jesus, the greater, clearly. 
Though when he begins his ministry, it's John who's the best known. Just as when Joshua began his ministry, it was Moses who was the well-known one. And yet they both are the greater second, Jesus and Joshua. Both of them beginning their ministry at the Jordan River and carrying on taking people to the promised land. That's people. How about the Passover? There's an interesting first that leads to a much greater second. No one denies the importance of the Passover. This is the night that brings freedom for the captives after 400 years. And yet, it's just the beginning. As we know, the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover is going to be when Jesus eats the supper with his disciples, and he goes from merely repeating to inaugurating and beginning something much greater, the second, the Lord's Supper. You know, the Passover has so many parallels, but let's just play with this, this one wonderful difference and fulfillment. If we were in a room eating the Passover that very first night, we would be protected by the shed blood that's on the doorpost outside of us. We'd be holding our breath that the angel of death would pass by because of that blood. And the greater the distance, all the better. That's the whole meaning of the night. It's the Passover. And we would hope that that power passes by. But what's the greater fulfillment of Passover in the supper? It's not more distance. It's not greater hiding. It's God coming to us. God coming within us. God saying, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. But it's not for your death. It's my broken body and my shed blood that comes to give life, not death. Isn't that a wonderful difference? Passover is a wonderful thing, but it's fulfillment in the much greater and the lasting and the life-giving supper, definitely better. It's not the first, it's the second that counts. So as you've been thinking about this, and as you're going to, if you're in a small group, discuss the application of this, what comes to mind? How will you care for the people of God knowing that God has this pattern? It's not the first, but the second that counts. Well, first of all, what is it saying about God's ongoing creation? He is still at work, not creating new worlds, but that he is still at work in this world. He is still creating out of this fallen world that which is good. And we shouldn't despair that all the goodness is some, like, somehow gone on those first six days, and we're left with nothing but a poor second. It's the second that counts. So think about this world, whether it's on a picture postcard perfect day or something much darker and drearier, but it's still this second world, this world in which God has put himself, this place in which he has taken his stand on the earth. This is the world, John 1, 14, in which the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and it's in this place that we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. It was wonderful to see perfection and perhaps to have God walk and speak to us in the garden, but it's better in this place because this is where the word takes flesh and we have seen and heard him. And what does this say about the wisdom of God despite our, well, our folly and our, our dismay? Remember that 1 Corinthians talks about this in chapter 1. Paul says that the wisdom of God though we esteem it as foolishness, is actually wiser than the wisdom of men. And the weakness of God, though we think of it as utterly weak and useless, is stronger than the strength of men. Of course, the weakness and the folly is found in the cross. And no one could imagine that anything good would come out of that, but we know it did. And I think that this, it's the second that counts, is really the message that centers on the gospel. And though it seems that nothing good is coming out of weakness and even death, that's just the beginning. There's something more to come. Think about that message as something to give to people who are struggling because it's biblically true. It's what God actually does. And finally, that's the point of those who are despairing. What does this say about the love and power of God that he's not yet done, that he still can do his work even over those who have on the brink of despair? I like Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. That's where Paul says, and we rejoice in our tribulation, for we know that tribulation brings about endurance, and endurance a proven character, and character hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. It's not the first tribulation. It's everything that follows that matters. 
And that ends up with hope that doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured forth in our hearts. So there's our first biblical principle, maybe the foundation, the most important, that God works not first, but through the second. I know you'll do a wonderful job of sharing that and helping people see the value of that second, whether they're in that second now or they're waiting for it. That's the one God is working. That's our first principle. Let's move on to our second. God cures with the illness itself. I need you to go back in time with me a little bit. Remember when you were young, oh, I'm not sure exactly what age you had been, when you were just old enough to be left home, though you were sick. You know, your, your family, at least the parent who would most often be with you or whoever was caring for you, had to go someplace. All you had was a, a cold. And you were old enough to be left home, all right? You'd spent the night before hacking and coughing and wheezing. You were going through the tissues like there was no tomorrow. You came down in the morning and you were sick. You were sick. And you were doing the best job you could of selling how sick you were. Because, of course, if you're really sick enough, you don't have to go to school. You can stay home. That sounds great. What did mom, let's just leave this as a mom thing, could be dad, but let's leave it as mom. If mom has to leave you home, sick, what does she surround you with? All kinds of good things, right? Comes to mind. Um, blanket, pillows, juice, something for lunch, maybe some way to get in touch with her. She asks you four times, are you warm enough, honey? She tells you you should rest, you should sleep, all those things. Sounds good, doesn't it? That's what we do. It's how we care for somebody who's got a simple cold. But what if she did this? You came downstairs, you flopped down on the couch there in the living room. Yep, you're sick. Mom took one look at you and said, I know. She goes upstairs to your room. She collects all the dead tissue, the Kleenex that you went through last night. And there's a lot. She brings it all down. She's got you laying on the couch. There's no pillow, there's no blanket, there's no stuffed animals, there's no juice, there's nothing. Just you lying on the couch. She drags a chair over right next to you, so you're looking right at the chair, just the same height. And on the chair, she piles up all the dead Kleenex, all the tissue that you went through yesterday. She piles that up on the chair, turns your little face to look at the tissue, and says, honey, just look at that, and you'll be fine. Really? No mother does that. Imagine if you were watching that. Well, you're looking in through the window, and you saw, that's going to be the cure? No. And that's the point. God cures with the illness itself. We cure with opposites, but God has a strange method, and it's that method it gives us hope. We cure with opposites. I mean, it's very, very simple, and I'm all for it. If your child is tired, you tell him to take a nap. If he's hungry, you give him something to eat. If he's cold, you wrap him up in a blanket. You can keep on going all day. That's our basic principle. We cure with the opposite of the problem. And you know what? A lot of times that works out just fine. But God has a different method. And I think the easiest way to see it, we'll just take one, two, three steps, is in what God does with the serpent. Think of the serpent. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent, of course, we picture the serpent, is our old enemy, the devil. How do we feel about the serpent by the end of chapter 3? Better, how does God act and deal with the serpent? It's his enemy, absolutely. He tells this serpent that he is going to be cursed above and beyond all livestock. It's going to eat dust and crawl on its belly. It is the object of God's anger and curse. Makes perfect sense. This serpent is going to be crushed. There you go. But wait a minute. The next step is a little different. Remember what God does in Numbers chapter 21. The people of Israel, again, were complaining about their life in the desert, complaining against Moses, really complaining against God. And God, in essence, said, enough. I have had enough of this complaining 
and whining and fussing. So remember what he does? He sends in the serpents. And the serpents bite the people. They die. Moses cries out for the behalf of the people for some remedy. And that's the amazing thing. Because now a serpent is being used as the agent of God. They're not sent by Satan. This is God's action. This is his intention. These serpents are causing death. And yet God has a solution for that. You remember what it is, of course. Moses is to make a bronze serpent, puts it up on a pole. Everyone who is bitten by the serpent is to look at the bronze serpent, and if they do, they live. Now let's go to the third step, and that's John chapter 3. Jesus has those wonderful parallel then between himself and Moses. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him will live. Of all the creatures, all the animals that God ever made, if God was going to pick one of them to use as a parallel to himself, would you have chosen the serpent? Genesis 3 we would have seen the serpent as the last creature God would ever have used as an image of himself. But isn't that our principle? God cures with the illness itself. Look at the serpent who bit you and you live. Look at that man who dies on the cross and there's life. God cures with the illness itself. And we've got to ask ourselves, why would he do that? It's an extraordinary thing. I think that we would expect God would show his power in simple and immediate ways. That God would act like we think. He would deal with illness and cure it with its simple opposite, health. And do so with every problem that we have. That would make sense. And sometimes God, of course, does exactly that. He removes the illness just like that. The miracles of Jesus time and again show that very, very power. And he does it in a simple and a direct way. But it isn't always that way. Sometimes God shows a willingness to wait. He lets evil run its own course, do everything it might possibly do, and then snatches that evil up and turns it in a way that really only God could make happen. I'd like you to picture, if you would, go back with me to Moses. Moses there in the desert with the snakes, the serpent going about. Now I know that Moses makes a bronze serpent. But I'd like you to just picture with me the animation, the the making it happen of God through Moses creating this serpent. A serpent has just done its work. It's just bit somebody. And that person, if we don't see any change, is going to die. Snatch that serpent up right behind its head. By the way, I don't like snakes, so this really works for me because I don't find anything attractive about a snake. Here it is. You've got him right there in your hand. There's his little head. There's his beady little eyes. There's his forked tongue. There's his fangs. But they're just beating the air because they can't quite get you. They'd love to, but they can't. Hold on to that serpent. Take a staff. Tie him onto that staff tight and hold him up. And there as he's stuck, Say to him this simple, simple thing. You came to kill, but you're going to stay to bring life. Wouldn't that just gall the serpent? He came to destroy, to kill, but he's tied in place whereby he has to give life instead. He's twisted and turned so much that he's actually doing the opposite of what he came for. Now that's God. That's creativity. That's power. That's doing what we would never even ask for or imagine. God cures with the illness itself. Now think about how you can use that in your ministry. How is that going to come with and to the people with whom you spend your time? Who needs to hear that this illness, this problem, this loss of a job, this tension within a family, this oh, illness and problem that will not go away, though we yearn for the opposite, and God might give the simple opposite, might also be the opportunity by which God is doing his work. You know, another parallel to this might be that thorn in the flesh that Paul experienced. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul asked three times that God would take it away, simply cure with the opposite, that is, here's the thorn. 
take it out. That'll be the solution. Remember what God said to Paul after those three prayers? My power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul says, in the end, all the more gladly. He rejoices, for when he is weak, then he is strong. Paul embraces the fact that God cures even through the presence of the illness itself. You probably are working with people, I'm sure on a regular daily basis, who are in the middle of that problem, who want to run as far from it as they possibly can. Help them to see that it might be in the hands of a creative God who is able to work and twist and turn even something as vicious as the serpent itself into the thing that in the end gives life. Because in the end, isn't that the center of our message? We're unusual people. If you're in a Christian hospital and a man is dying, what do you give him for hope? What do you put on the wall for him to see that he might have hope in his closing hours? You don't put a picture of a mountain meadow, a beautiful sunrise or sunset. You don't have bunnies playing in the grass. No. You put a picture of a man on a cross dying the most horrible death. And then you point to that man in his last hours and say, there's your hope. Because that is our hope. God cures with the illness itself. It's the center of our message. There's your second principle. Now that principle gives hope in the darkest time, and that really leads exactly to our third one. Our third is a wonderful verse. As I said, it's Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Joy comes in the morning. Well, when are you and where are you right now? The where and when is the difference between night and day. I just want you to go with me, if you would, into some long, dark night, and um, you're waiting for the time to pass. In our house, we have clocks, Holly and I, my wife and I, beside our beds so that we can see them if we happen to turn them in the right way. But sometimes they're turned, in, I don't know why, so that you can't really see them. So what you have to do is depend on the clock that's in the living room that chimes out the hours. And every half hour, it just gives a single boom. If you're having a bad night, if you're worried, you're tossing, you're turning, it's still as black as black can be, does time go by quickly or slowly? Does that clock ring out as fast as you'd like it to? Does it ring out all the numbers you want to hear? Or do you just hear finally, bong? What is even that? Oh, haven't we all gone through long, long, Nights, nights that seem to be beyond all proportion to any manner of actual time. It's like the clock must have broken. The batteries must be dead. There's no time going on this slowly. That's the night, isn't it? Worries, trouble, tarry. What a great verb. Tarry for the night. And they expand that night much longer than we imagine. And yet, on the other hand, when day comes, we look back on that night and say, oh, well, yes, it was long. It seemed much longer than it actually was. But once the dawn comes, once morning is, that night fades. And that's the basic biblical principle. Let's take a look at some of the examples biblically that we have where weeping endures for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. Maybe first think of Noah. When we think of Noah, we think, of course, of 40 days of darkness and rain, but, you know, his weeping was much longer than that. There were the decades that it took to build the ark. That couldn't have been easy, pleasant, without ridicule. And then there was the crashing of the 40 days of actual rain. But by then, the flood has taken over the world, and he is for months in the ark. Filled with, I'm sure, all the questions. What will the world be like? Will there be life again? Will he ever get off of this thing? What an enormous, long night. But in the end, what comes? Of course, hope, life. An uh, olive branch that says there's life again. And finally, leaving the ark. Weeping endures for a night, a very long night, with all its rain and mud. 
joy in the morning. Joseph, there is an example. Remember the hatred by his brothers towards Joseph? So that they capture him, they sell him off to Egypt. He's imprisoned as a slave. He is misunderstood and mistreated. He is put into prison falsely for an extended time. He is forgotten by those who promise that they will remember him. All of that goes on and on and on for Joseph. Given up as dead by his family, and then the night is over. It's a long night, isn't it? It's years and years. And yet Joseph has faith. Joseph even has compassion on his brothers. He welcomes them when he could have destroyed them. There's weeping only for a night. And then joy comes in the morning. David's a good example. David has to wait a long time, doesn't he? He's told that he's going to be the king in place of Saul. But he doesn't snatch it up. Remember, he has opportunities to take Saul's life twice. He lets him go. He lives himself, hunted. He dwells in the caves. All of that is his long night. And he's patient in that long night. Joy is going to come in the morning. Maybe the end is the best. Psalm 103 tells us about the forgiveness that God gives us. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. If we feel that we're in a night of God's anger, remember, he does not deal with us according to what we've done, our past, our sins. He forgives us. And as far as east is from the west, so far he removes our past from us. That's his promise. And so think again about the people who you are serving. How can you help them to embrace this, this great news, that joy will come in the morning? It's better to have this, isn't it? It's the purpose of God. I think as a general approach to life, hope is better than despair. Well, almost anyone would say that. Any popular self-help text would say that it's better to be hope-filled than despairing. But we have a biblical reason for it. It's not just, well, life will be better. But this is the promise of God. God can't make these kind of promises and then restrict them to someone else or some other time. When he says, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning, he puts this as a hope to be grasped by every person, ourselves, and every person that we meet and deal with. Here is our hope. Joy will come in the morning. I know right now that slow ticking of the clock seems endless. I know, and you've experienced it, that it is very dark before the dawn comes. We've all been through those times, and maybe there's more to come. But we've been given a promise. And you're going to share that promise with people you know very well who need to hold on to this in the darkness. Joy comes in the morning. Now that's hope that leads then to our fourth biblical principle, grace turns your world upside down. Wouldn't it be great, and often is the case, that when God's mercy comes to us into our world, everything would turn out great. When God's mercy would come, it would be, well, like a welcome shower on dry ground. And you know, if you've been through any kind of a drought, it doesn't take long and pow, everything is looking great and coming up where it was dormant. That makes sense to us. The grace and mercy of God would come like a shower that always bears immediate and positive fruit. But sometimes, and this is important to help people realize, the mercy of God, when it comes, really turns our world upside down. How does that happen for people? Well, I'd like you to consider a couple of people that seem to be the best examples, Mary and Paul. Let's start with Mary. Who could get better news? When the angel in Luke chapter 1 visits Mary, it's with good news. She is blessed. She has been found to have favor with God. She is going to be the one through whom the Savior comes. This is great news. Oh my, but what happens to Mary's life? It is really turned upside down, isn't it? When that news comes to Joseph, with whom she is engaged, Joseph is done. He is ready to divorce her and be through with her. Oh my goodness, her world is just turned upside down. And not for the better. Imagine the consternation of Mary. She has this unbelievable, cannot be explained pregnancy. And she is alone in the world. And I suspect no one really to understand and believe her. She is given help, of course. Wonderful Elizabeth is given as the one who understands. Elizabeth is expecting the miraculous birth of John the Baptist at the time. But wouldn't Mary's life be a great example of this? When the mercy of God comes, sometimes, at least, at first, 
life is going to turn upside down. Take Paul as the other example. Paul had it together, didn't he? Acts chapter 9. He's a Pharisee. He says of himself that he was, as to legalistic righteousness, faultless. He had done everything he possibly needed or could do. He is filled with zeal for protecting God in his name. But what happens? Of course, Acts chapter 9. He's met on the Damascus Road. Blinding light, his moment of clarity and revelation, and he is pitched into darkness. What a great opposite. God loves those kind of contrasts. And then once he, three days later, is baptized, sees again, and is confirmed in that faith, begun on the road, what happens to his life? <laughs> it's never the same, is it? Gone is his security. He begins to proclaim who Jesus is, what has happened to him. And he is from that time on a marked man. He is going to spend a great number of his days and years, in fact, in jail. He is, as he describes in 2 Corinthians 11, beaten, shipwrecked, abandoned, stoned, left for dead, all of those things. Life turns upside down. Why? Because great grace has come. Now, when you hear this principle, you've got to make sure that one thing is very clear. The mercy of God doesn't need our payment. It's not that God gives us a measure of mercy or grace, and then the world turns upside down so that we pay for it. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. It's simply this. Mercy begets astonishing change. Mercy, the grace of God, puts some things away that formerly were our everyday. And then we look at them with new eyes and say, uh, not anymore. I'll use a very simple example. Our youngest daughter just graduated from college. She began her new worlds of work. She's now gone in just a very short time. In fact, over the course of a weekend, she went from college student to young professional showing up for work every day. The biggest change is wardrobe. She doesn't look the same. She can't wear the same clothes. In fact, we've noticed an astonishing amount of her old clothes going out the door because, well, as she says, I can't wear these things anymore. This is what you wear when you're still a senior in college. This is what you wear when you just wake up just in time to go to class. And she, I'm so glad, realizes you can't wear that to the job. You can't be taken seriously, even though it's just a weekend worth of change. It's a good thing to have a job. It's great to show up for work every morning. But the good news of a job and a paycheck, all good, begets change. And some things are just never the same. Isn't the grace of God saying, boy, it's a wonderful thing that God's mercy comes, but be prepared for the upset of life, not as payment, not as God extracting something from us, but just think of what happens when forgiveness comes. It comes in such an abundance that it overflows from us to someone else. That's God's plan. That's going to make things different in our life. When the mercy of God comes, we are joined with the Trinity. When God Father, Son, Spirit dwell with us. When we're filled with the Spirit from baptism on, that's got to make life different. It can't just be the same as it's always been. When we're given a mission, maybe not as dramatic as Paul or Mary's, but a mission nonetheless, it's going to change priorities, what we put our energy and our time, our money into. Things are going to be different. Help people as you're dealing with them to work through this very idea. The grace and mercy of God has come. And then when they ask, why is this happening to me? Why is my world not as settled, as secure? Why is it turned upside down? Help them to see that it's not God's vengeance. It's not God getting payment out of us. It's not God preparing us for something worse. It's the common pattern that people of all ages have seen. The mercy and grace of God will turn your life upside down. Well, those are our four biblical principles. And I know that either in your discussions with each other as a group or your individual thinking, you're putting those into practice with people that you are now seeing or you're going to see. And it's seeing those people that's our last stop. How do you visit people? And why? For what purpose? Who do you visit? Where? All a wonderful set of questions. Let's spend just a little time in our closing to discuss the visitation of the many people you have an opportunity to be with 
in your congregation or beyond the limits of a congregation. We have a number of principles or things we want to touch on. Why visit at all? The program for a visitation. Should you make an appointment or just stop in on someone? How do you start the visit? What do you listen for in terms of spiritual life? How do you build a relationship through that visit? And what do you do in terms of a devotion in the, at the end of the visit or at any time that you have? Let's talk about reasons to visit. There are so many. Um, I think the simplest and most direct is to learn about the person you're visiting, the member's life. If it's a congregational member or it's someone you're simply given the opportunity to meet in a nursing home, in a hospital, but it's your chance to learn about their life. Sure, there's going to be an opportunity for you to tell them about yourself, you to give them a gift of your devotional thoughts, but at its heart, we're here to make a bond between ourselves and that person by learning about them. This is the bridge, and the purpose of the bridge is for us to cross to them, much more for, than for them to cross over to us. And so it's a chance to learn about them, and best, in a setting that's expressive of themselves. They don't have to tell the whole story. Oh my goodness, especially if you're visiting them in their home or even in a nursing home where everything is compacted, you get a chance to see them reflected in everything that's around them. It's a wonderful chance. That's the first reason. It makes a bond with people. When you come to them, oh, and you do simple things. You share a, a very small meal. You, you have coffee together. You, you do something that links the two of you together. It's a bond people will remember. They'll speak about it again and again. By the way, I personally hope that you have bad weather because they'll especially remember that you came in the middle of the storm. If it's a snowstorm or rain pouring down, you came no matter what. And even if they had to help you get out because the snow was coming down so much, they'll remember you came. Who would ever think that bad weather would be of some kind of value? It really is, though, when you're making visits with people. Pray that it's a challenge to get to these folks because they'll make sure they remember that. They'll, they'll remember, remind you of that down the road. You'll bring some devotional materials, I think, uh, and this is a wonderful idea. Because think of the opportunity you have in going to somebody's home, home especially. You'll bring the word, the name, the prayers to Jesus in a place that might not have heard them in a very long time. If these are church members or they're outside the church. It still might be a long time since anybody said the name of Jesus in a positive way. It's a long time since somebody said a prayer around that kitchen table. It's been forever since somebody opened up a Bible and read from it, sitting on that couch, and actually turned the TV off so that the Word of God might be heard more than whatever else is coming out. I mean, think of the opportunity you have to do that, to make a, a beachhead or to reestablish the presence of God in this place. He's always there, of course, and you're not the only connection that they might have. But you get to do it, and you get to bring out his name, his prayers, his presence in a place that, you know, it might have been a long time, and you're the only one in any human way that we can imagine, you're the only one who's going to bring it there for them. And I think that, in the end, lets you then be as Jesus was himself and the disciples. Jesus came into our midst. He could have forever hovered above us. He could have had a distance spoken to us. He Hebrews chapter 1, could have continued to speak to us just through the uh, prophets. But now in these latter days, he has spoken to us by his Son. He's taken human flesh to be here among us, and that's the model for us. If he was willing to take on the anonymity of 30 years as carpenter, if he was willing to walk with us when he could have simply immediately disappeared, if he would do all those ordinary things just to be with us, why wouldn't we do the same? Just to be with the people we minister to, to meet them in their homes especially, just as he did. It's a great chance. So those are wonderful reasons for going. Now, when you go, I'm going to suggest that you have a, a program, you have a plan for these visits. And why would you do that? As opposed to just by random 
happen to drop in on somebody and next time happen to drop on somebody else. Well, I think first of all, you can prepare well. If you know that you're going to visit everyone in a certain set of members, you're going to visit, for instance, all the people who have had a child born or come into their life in the last two years, so all the young parents. If you're going to visit all those, and you do this on an ongoing basis, who have lost a spouse or family member in the last year or two. If you're going to visit all those who have recently moved into the community. Whatever set of people and visits you're making, you can plan for that. You're going to do really well. Now, of course, you'll get better and better at it as you go along, but the materials you bring, the purpose for your visits, they'll be honed. By the time you make the 80th visit of the same set, you'll be really good at what you're saying. You almost want to go back and do the first ones over again, I can assure you. But you'll be good at it, and it gets better and better. So have that as a hope. The other reason is if you have a plan and you're carrying that plan out, it'll explain why are you visiting this person. People wonder, why are you here? It disarms their fears if you can explain that they're part of a larger group. Now, it doesn't diminish them as being important. Do your best to say, but I'd love to come and see you anyway. But it diminishes their anxiety as, why are you coming? What's wrong? Because for some strange reason, a visit from somebody related to the church often makes people nervous. Something's wrong, money is involved, something's up. No, no. Put those fears away. Explain that they are part of this larger pattern of visits that you're having. It's uh, sometimes necessary also for an incentive for yourself to visit somebody who, well, face it, you would probably avoid if you could. If you're anything like me, I could avoid people, absolutely. Or at least put that person way, 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 way at the end of the list. But you know what? If you've got uh, a, a pattern, if you're accountable to someone, and I trust you are, somebody wants to know, well, did you visit them all? You want to look at them in the eye and say, yes, I did. Because they're probably going to ask, did you even visit, and then I'll let you fill in the blank, whoever it is the least likely to be visited. You want to be able to say, and I did. So that's a good reason to have a set pattern. It'll force you to finally go there. Lastly, it'll assure those who want to visit that you'll get around. You know, oddly enough, while I said that there's some reluctance by many to have a visit by someone from the church, somebody's going to want it. And as soon as they hear that, oh, you're visiting people, well, why didn't you visit me? How come you came across the street to that person, but you didn't get over to me? There's a reason. And so you've got this plan, and you'll assure them that in some other way, you're going to get to visit them also. Oh, of course, you can always visit someone just on the spur of the moment. If they're eager to have you come, great. But it's an incentive and it's also an assurance. You'll get around to it. Now, with that sort of a program and plan, my next thought is let them know you're coming. Uh, I would suggest you let people know that you're going to drop in, uh, stop in, visit. You have an intentionality to this visit as much as possible. Usually, oh, I don't know, a few days in advance, let them know that you're coming. Um, that's courteous, and there's many ways that you can do it, of course. You can call, you can email, you can text them, you can do all sorts of things, whatever it is at your setting that might be the best. Maybe you allow them to choose the time, and you just say, I have all these openings, I'd love to come and see you. By the way, doing that, however, puts you at a geographical uh, disadvantage. You'll end up going from one corner to the opposite in virtually no time. So it's a little challenging to give them the full reign over your schedule. What if, how, however, though, what do you do if someone, despite your best efforts, just doesn't want you to come? Do you give up? Well, I'll leave to your wisdom how to exactly do this, but I've got to tell you the story of Grace and the Kitchen Curtains. When I was in Butternut, we had a, a, a woman who uh, was disinclined to be with people at all. Uh, simply put, she was a hermit. She uh, came into town, our little 400-person town, once every two weeks to buy groceries. And otherwise, she was at home in an older farmhouse out far in the woods. And you know you're really in the woods when you live in a 400-person town and think of that as really in the woods. 
She uh, ha had a green Ford that she parked out by the uh, door, and so you always knew when she was there, which was all the time. And you could see that Ford and her house from the road when you went by. Well, we hadn't seen her in a very long time at our church, so I called her up one day and I said, gosh, I'd love to come and visit. And uh, Grace said, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be home. And I thought to myself, of course you're going to be home. You're always home, Grace. We all know that. Well, I said, well, you know, I, I know I'm going to be going by, so why don't I just take a chance? I'll be there and at whatever time, let's say 3 o'clock. Well, I pull in, and uh, by the way, just as a little context, I, uh, I have an odd hobby. I like old cars, and I have a 1917 Model T Ford, really. It's something I restored. I bought as a piece of junk, and I put it back together, and I, I drive it. And I drove it that day. I drove it a lot there in Butternut. It's a great conversation starter when you pull into a yard with a 1917 Model T Ford. Oh, my gosh. Well, anyway, I pulled in with the Model T, which is pretty hard to miss, and uh, there's no question who's driving that. It had to be me. I pulled into Grace's place, parked next to her Ford. There it is. Grace is home. Knocked on the door. Bum, 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 bum. Nothing. Bum, 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 bum. Nothing. Third time. Bum, 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 bum. I mean, you can hear it everywhere. The neighbors knew I was knocking. Nothing. Oh, man. I know you're there, Grace. Well, not much I can do. Got back to the Ford, cranked it. By the way, it's so old, you have to hand crank it. There she's running. Climb into the Model T, back it out, just start going. And I look at the house one last time, and the kitchen curtain moved. Ah, Grace, I saw it. She knew I saw it. I know she's there. She knows that I know that she's there. Back up the Model T, park the Model T, get out, go to the door, bam, 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 bam. She came to the door. Grace, oh, you must have been upstairs. You must not have heard me. I'm so glad I thought to come back and give it another try. That's what you say. Grace let me in. You know, we had a great visit that day at uh, Grace's kitchen, and uh, it worked out this way. I was hoping that I would be allowed by Grace to come and visit her every month, and uh, let's just admit she's a shut-in by her choice. She's not going to come to church. She just was not going to. And so I said, Grace, you know, um, it's probably been a long time since you've had the Lord's Supper, and uh, I'd be happy to come and, and uh, bring it for you. And she said, I have the Lord's Supper every week. I thought, really? Grace doesn't go anywhere. So I asked her, how do you do that? On the kitchen counter, there was a really old radio. And Grace pointed to the radio and she says, when Peace, that's Peace Lutheran Church, six miles away, they're on the radio every Sunday at 1045. She said, when Peace has communion, I have it too. Again, I'm thinking, how's that work? So I said, well, how do you do that? She said, I have my cracker and I have my grape juice, and when they take communion, so do I. That was really nice. I was really moved that Grace would think that much of taking communion, given the fact that she wasn't going to go anywhere, to try to do it that way. I said, Grace, that's just wonderful. Good for you. You know, you can keep doing that, but I'd like to come and bring communion from your church. Peace is wonderful through the radio, but St. Paul's is your church. Would it be all right if I come and we had communion here once a month? I'd call, I'd let you know, we'd find a time that was good. I held my breath, I gotta tell you. And Grace said that would be okay, and it was. And from then on, we came. By the way, that door that barely opened, it really did barely open. After a few months of me trying to squeeze through the door, which was really hard to do, let me tell you, I asked Grace if it would be okay if I brought a couple of the high school boys on a Saturday and we worked her door so it actually would open easier for her and for, well, me to get in. And she said that was okay. And one Saturday morning, I remember it was cold and kind of rainy, two of the high school youth group boys came with me. We worked on that door and we got it to actually open. And the fact that Grace would let two, and she doesn't know these boys from anyone, two little boys from high school and me open her door and keep it actually opening, 
I thought that was a big step in Grace's world and a big step in her relationship with our church. Kept making those visits right up to the end when Grace finally, she went briefly into a nursing home and then passed away. But the best times were visiting her at home. So make your appointments, keep them of course, but be diligent sometimes with, well, Grace, you have to keep trying. I also throw out this idea that you have times when somebody has come home and only now are they home. Uh, you'll be in touch with the people that you serve. You'll know the changes in their lives, but you'll also know not only their life, but the lives of those who are around them. Think of the college students. Think of the fellows and, and young women who are serving in our military. Think of those who've been away at a distant job and are now home. Those are at least three categories of people who come into the lives of your members, and you'd want to be a part of that too. Don't take up precious time if they only have a day or so, just make a three minute visit, a stop in if possible. You might appoint, make an appointment, you might just stop in, but I'll guarantee that people will be impressed, that you remember that their daughter is home from college, their son came home on a nine day furlough after Afghanistan for a year, the husband finally got home after being in China for two months and you got there oh, in the first week or so after he's home. Make those kind of connections with people. Maybe they're a little more spontaneous, but it shows that you care. Well, let's start the visit itself now. When you walk in, I say you start your visit with your eyes. Take in what's all around you. Look around at the things that are there on display for you to see. There are so many wonderful things to see. Um, if possible, take a tour of the house if people want to show you around. Uh, you can bring that out by just saying, gee, I." I don't think I've ever had a chance to be here before. This is a wonderful house. Most people will say, would you like to see it? And the answer is always, yes, see it. You'll be amazed at the things you'll see. You'll be amazed at the things you'll learn about. They'll take you inside, outside, upstairs, downstairs, all over the place. You go and just take in the whole experience. Don't worry about the time. This is the most important thing you can be doing, making that bridge with their place taking in what's going on with them. And ask questions about this. Um, there are wonderful questions to be asked. Uh, some of them are the standards. Charles Miller, Jr. was a wonderful, wonderful preacher and uh, caregiver. I had a chance to know him uh, many years ago. He had three great questions that he said. Uh, he was an extensive traveler, never failed him. If he meets somebody, met somebody new, he would always ask them, how's your family? How's work? And where have you lived before this place, this time? They're simple, aren't they? But you know what? They'll absolutely work. If you show a lively interest in the answers that people have, where have they been, how's it going, what's the family, and especially if you're in their home and you're surrounded by the pictures of the family, you've got mementos from the last place they lived, you've got certificates or awards or something related to school or work, you can't miss but make those connections with people. And they'll appreciate that you cared about that. Uh, look at the refrigerator. I always say the best place to visit is the kitchen. It's much more uh, true to the family life than any other room. So sit in the kitchen if you can. Just sit on that kitchen table, not the dining room table, the one with the lace on the top that nobody ever uses. The plain everyday, this is where we eat. That's the place to meet kitchen if you can. The sofa or the living room, if you have to, that's fine. If it looks like a place that people actually use. But as much as possible, be in the place where they spend the most time. Finally, <coughs> excuse me, ask about things you don't know. You know, it's very likely that they're going to have experiences, interests, artifacts that you've never encountered. Listen to them. This is not a time to bring up your own experiences. Not a time to match them story for story. Say you don't know anything about this. I mean, be honest. I don't know anything about this. But it looks really interesting. You'd be amazed the things you can learn about that you had no knowledge of, no experience with whatsoever. But if you show some interest, people will show you. They'll tell you all the things that people would love to have you know if you just ask them about it. So, say you don't know, but you love to learn. That goes a long way. Then as you're doing that, look for the spiritual life in this house and in this family. There's a lot of ways for people to do this. Now, sometimes if they know you're coming, they make a special effort to put out things that you can see so that you'll be impressed. But 
whether it's that or it's the instant, the, the, the genuine, look for it. Um, look for the, the Bible that's there, and especially one that looks like it's actually been used. There's wear on the covers. It's not the ornamental one that's on a coffee table. It's that one over there, especially if it's got bookmarks stuck inside of it, something like that. Look for a devotional guide, portals of prayer or something, especially a current one that's dog-eared. Looks like there's actually been going through it day by day. Wonderful news to have. Even look for something as simple as a church calendar, a church newsletter, a church something, a bulletin or something that says, yep, you're in contact with this congregation. Whatever it is that you can, find a link, if possible, between their spiritual life in their house. It might be a picture, by the way. It could be a cross on the wall. It could be something that you can point out and say, that's a beautiful cross. That's a wonderful picture. I've always liked that poem, Footprints in the Sand, or whatever it is that you can make us a part of what you're discussing. Along with learning about their hobbies, take note of what they have as spiritual life. And when you do that, affirm that they have a lively spiritual life. I think it's much safer, even if these are people who you haven't seen in a long time, to affirm that, yes, they're people of faith. Affirm that they are people who pray. They're people who read the scriptures. They are those who remember their catechism faith. They are those who still say and believe the apostles and the Nicene Creed. Start on that basis. Only change that if they push you to say, no, it's not that way anymore. But you're much better off, it seems to me, to go on the assumption of that, making them partners with you in spiritual life, not as those who are going to be questioned to see if they have spiritual life. They'll know the difference. They'll sniff it out in just a minute, which one it is that you see them as. Make sure that they're people who you see and you express a confidence as having a spiritual life. Then use that spiritual life. Have a devotional plan with them. Uh, most of the time, it's at the end. Your devotional message will come after you've visited, you've noticed their life, you've taken the tour, you've gotten through whatever it is as a message you want to have. You've probably got this prepared in somewhat in advance, but be prepared to also you know, adapt to this one way or the other. What, what is it going to, to be? Maybe this family has a unique need and you'll just scrap everything else that you normally do. But have it. You might have uh, this something you alone say. It could be just a, a reading. It's a few devotional thoughts on the basis of a text. You can ask them for what they sh we should pray about, and then you say the prayer. Or it could be something that you share. Maybe you simply put out, use their Bible, uh, the scripture that you're going to look at. Talk together about what this scripture means for them, their family right now, for the plans that you have and they have, for the church or the ministry that's going on, for, well, maybe it's something as large as, what does our nation need right at this time? And what does this text, what does this action of God suggest for us in the future? So you can do this cooperatively with them. Again, ask them what we should pray about and then pray about those things. You can have both ask for and you can celebrate things as you ask them. Enjoy the opportunity. Uh, this is really a wonderful time to ask questions and learn their answers. Um, as I mentioned, you want to give them a reason for your presence. Uh, up front, don't leave them asking it. Answer, why are you here? Uh, say right up front, you're here. And uh, of course, to enjoy them, to get to know them. You're here because they're part of your ministry, your congregation, the circuit of care that you have. But also make sure that they stand out in that circle. You're not just here to, well, get that check off in the box of their address or their name but there's something special about them. If you can find that, if you can admire something about their place, if you know something about their past or their history, if you know something about their interests, if you're a little unclear about their family, in some way, make a reason for why this visit is important and stands out. Say things like, you know, I've always wondered about, I've been looking forward to learning about, I was never quite sure about, and then something about themselves that's gonna come out of this visit. Uh, leave open the conclusion of the visit, uh, even, of course, even the time. I know you have to think about time. 
and you do have a schedule and you want to stay on that schedule, but leave open the exact when are you going to be done. Uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes is usually, in my experience, a good length of time for most visits. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing, a real crisis that's going to take something of an hour for you to be there. That could happen, but in just a normal visit, most people are well geared up for something much, much shorter than that. And especially if this is someone you've met before and you're going to see again. 20 minutes, 30 minutes works really well. Now, of course, if you're visiting in the hospital, that might not be anywhere near the time you have. People are doing tests. They have to go. Somebody's coming in. You might be lucky to get two or three minutes in a crisis situation. Be glad of what you get and just accept with a promise you'll come back for more. Um, avoid the predictions also on the explanation of why you're here. I used to say something foolish like, uh, I was going by your place anyway. Oh, well, it was true. That's why I stopped in. Um, and I was going by, and I could tell you the place I was and the, the place I'm going to, and yes, you're right in the middle, but it wasn't a very good thing to say to somebody. I'm going by your place anyway, so I thought I'd stop. Man, that just destroys all the importance of these people. And so don't be like I am or like I was and use a lame excuse like that. Uh, hold up instead the importance of these folks on their own, regardless of you were going by anyway. A few cautions about the visit itself. Some people are eager to tell their story, some are reluctant. Um, some are just overflowing. They will tell you the story, they're glad to. If you're coming at the uh, end of a crisis, if your visit is uh, one of after the birth, uh, two weeks after the child has come home, obviously you're gonna talk about how was the pregnancy, how was the delivery, how were the adventures in the hospital. They are gonna be glad to tell you about that. Um, if you're visiting, for instance, a widow, and her husband, surprisingly, just passed away in his sleep one afternoon. She will tell you that story probably every time you visit for months, maybe, maybe years. Uh, by the way, that would be my mother. Uh, she told us the story in detail again and again of how dad simply fell asleep after lunch in the nursing home and passed away. And she had no idea it was going to be that day. Well, we didn't either, Mom. But You'll hear the same story, you'll hear it again and again with no prompting. By the way, my suggestion is, always, since you know you're gonna hear this again, leave a question or two for the future. Don't use up all the questions you can think of. Don't draw the, question, the story out as fully as you possibly can the first time you visit. You know you're gonna be back, and you're gonna hear it again, so you can authentically leave a point of saying, you know, I was wondering about, and bring that question up later. Now, on the other hand, some people are, are pretty reluctant to talk. If it's been a long time since they've been visited by anybody from the church, uh, if they're surprised that anybody from the church even knew they existed, if they followed them or know their address or even thought they were still members, it might take a while before they're willing to listen to you and take in all that you want to share. So cut the visit short if you need to. Do uh, some of the talking yourself. Uh, you might even plan ahead and think of a way in which to, to have something interest. I, I got to tell you, showing up again with a Model T Ford is an instant attention getter and conversation starter. I remember once visiting a, a gentleman who had moved into our area. He had never met me. I just learned that somebody had moved into literally the old Schultz place. I went, we started talking about my car, and we stood there talking about old cars for about 20 minutes until he finally said to me, who are you and why are you here? And I then explained who I was. But, you know, I thought it was better to make the bridge with him as a person, lest he would be put off by the idea, oh, the Lutheran pastor from down the road came to visit us because we're new here and he just wants us to join. So make a connection if possible, as long as it possibly can be, but be willing to say, yeah, it's, it's going to be short for some folks. Um, Remember what they said before also. Uh, this is crucial. If you've gone to a, a member and they shared something about, well, here, here's one literally that could happen. I remember when I was visiting you know, this particular family, uh, their daughter had cancer and was beginning that month the first round of chemotherapy in Colorado. We're in northern Wisconsin. 
the family, mom and dad, were talking about their daughter, who I had never met. And there was really no prospect I ever would meet her. But, of course, this was the centerpiece of their worries. What will the treatments be like? Will they work? How will the cancer react? All of those things. I saw them again a month later. And the first thing after, hi, how are you doing? I got to ask, how is your daughter doing with the cancer treatments? How is the chemo going for her? Have they gotten any news from the tests? You know, the questions you would ask. Work like a charm. It wasn't work. It was just remembering. Remembering that this was the most important thing to them a month ago. It's got to be the most important thing to them now. And if you can remember that and bring that up very first before they do, man, what a great bridge is built. You're, you're valued because you remembered and you esteemed the things that matter to them. So that's the assigned reading. The test comes the next time you come, and you'll pass the test, I'm sure of it. How close should you get? One of the mechanics of a visit like this is where you should be and the value of nearness. As a general rule, it, uh, it is good to at some point uh, have a, a nearness, whether it's just a simple handshake at the beginning and at the end. But it also depends on the person and the setting that you're in. Um, how familiar with them are you? The more familiar, a little closer perhaps. You're just meeting this person, keep some personal distance and space. What's the crisis going on? Is this just a get to know you sort of visit? Or is this person someone who has just lost their spouse after 55 years? More closeness for the second, obviously. Who else is around? Are you there in the company of many in the family? That's a safer time and space to be near someone when there are many who are consoling someone, then you're all alone at their home, just the two of you, again, some distance. Closeness, a warm touch, firm handshake, even that, that shoulder, arm around the shoulders, great things all to be used at the right time, the right place. I know you have the wisdom to do that. It might be a wonderful thing to discuss as a group. Also, finally, keep looking. Uh, eye contact, crucial, isn't it? Be able to look at someone most of the time. It conveys an interest in them, uh, a willingness, a, a fearlessness that says, you're the most important thing here. In general, my experience is that when they're speaking to you, you focus on them. They'll be encouraged to keep on speaking when they realize that you want to see them virtually nonstop. Now, when you do the speaking, I think it's sometimes all right for you to give them a visual break and every so often to, to notice something, to point out something. That's a really interesting picture on the wall. And then you can both look over there for a while, give them a break from just this line of sight. But maintain that nearness of sight and that nearness of touch is a key part of visits. I hope that you enjoy making visits on members in hospitals, nursing homes, in their homes especially. I know you'll do a wonderful job of connecting with them. Enjoy the discussion on how to use these principles, how you're already using them, ways that you've gone beyond them in your own ministry. But thank you for letting me share with you these ideas, both of biblical principles and of how to visit people as you show care for God's people. Thank you.